Hello, hello, hello. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time of fellowship, for this time where we have gathered together to seek wisdom and truth, Father, which is found in your word. We come to you in Jesus' name. We pray your blessing, your anointing, your very presence, your peace upon our fellowship, upon this meeting. We pray that the word would go forth with clarity and understanding and plant in our hearts and minds truth and life and light, which is found in your word. We thank you for blessing our fellowship. In Jesus' name, amen. John chapter 1 and verse 26, it says, And John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom you know not. He it is who cometh after me is preferred before me, whose shoe latchets or shoelaces I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Bethbara, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, and he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And Jared bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him, and I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. And the next day after John stood and his two disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. Amen? Amen. And here, this is the third part to a series, uh, I think it's the third part, third part, called Self-Deception and True Salvation. And you know, last week, we studied the condition of man. We looked at his condition that, that through Adam's sin, uh, sin perpetuated through humanity, through the male seed, that generation after generation was born in Adam's sin, and therefore, every human being, male or female, born of a man and a woman, right, uh, had or had a need for salvation because they were born essentially with condemnation or judgment upon them. And this is a difficult thing for the world to understand that all of humanity needs salvation, you know. And so we learned that Jesus, we learned why the virgin birth, right? He had to be born outside of Adam's transgression. That's why. You know, when, when God was talking to Sat Satan, Adam, and Eve, he said, from the seed of this woman is going to come one who's going to suffer a painful bruise to his heel. It's painful. But he's going to crush your seed, Satan, your seed's head. And so we see there that, that, that this challenge that we see throughout Scripture. But we understand that from the seed of the woman, we learn that the seed of a woman is holy. There's, it's still, it's, it, it, it's the male seed because the man had the transgression, right? And so we learn because of that, Jesus could only be the way to heaven. There is no other way to get to heaven. He was the only way because he was born of a virgin. He was God's perfect sacrifice. Well, here we see uh, in part three, we see that, J that John says, now this is interesting because the, when, G when Mary hears that she's going to be pregnant from the angel Gabriel, right? The, the angel tells her, Gabriel tells her, your cousin Elizabeth is pregnant. She's compelled immediately to go to her, right? And Luke, I think it's Luke chapter 1. And, and she goes to her, but here John says, I didn't know him. Now they're cousins, when you think about it. So we don't know what happened historically, but she was compelled to go, and the angel told her, your, 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 your cousin's going to have a child in her old age, right? And so they're cousins, but here John says it twice, I, I don't know him. But God gave me a sign that when the Holy Spirit came upon him and remained on him, he was the one. And so as you're standing there, picture standing around, and John says, Behold the Lamb of God. To us, it doesn't mean as much. Okay? I mean, we, we look at it. I mean, when you study Scripture, it takes on meaning. But back then, 
they were sacrificing a lamb every year, right? So, so what they did was all the way back from the, uh, from the law of Moses, and you can even make a record all the way back to the garden because they had coats of skin, but, but from the garden, we, from, from, uh, from Moses, we see them slay a lamb on the Passover and paint the doorpost with the blood of, of that lamb and then eat the Passover lamb. And then from generation to generation, they continued to take an innocent lamb. They took a, a, a very young lamb, innocent, without blemish, and they would sacrifice that lamb and they would put the blood of the lamb on the mercy seat, which, which, was, which was in the temple or in the tabernacle. And this would be an atonement for them year after year after year. So families would do it, and they, you know, and, and if you were poor, you got multiple families to do it. But they would do this in remembrance not only of what God did for them in the Passover, but also it pointed to the Messiah. It's called shadow Christology, where it pointed, they did things that pointed to Christ. And so God was teaching them that something innocent had to pay for the sins of man and blood had to be shed. So you're standing there and all of a sudden John points to a man. And he says, the Lamb of God? This is, this is God's Lamb? This is a man. You know, so, so when, when you look at this, it was very profound to them back then, but this was the representative, this, the, the Lamb was a representative of this man that was born on the earth. Amen? So go over to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 1 it says, For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. So he's saying that this is a shadow, the law, for the law having a shadow or a type of or an image of things to come that it couldn't make the, the, the comer every year with the lamb, what, perfect. It says, for, for then would they not have ceased to be offered. But because the worshipers, once purged, should have no more conscience of sin, but in those sacrifices there is remembrance again made for sin every year. You know, they had to do it every year, every year. It was a type of atonement, but it was temporary. It says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Okay? Now look at verse 5. It says, wherefore, when he, and that's Jesus, cometh into the world, he saith, sacrifice and offerings thou wouldn't, wouldst not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. Now this is first person. The Bible is quoting something that Jesus said prior to his coming into the earth, his birth into the earth. Remember, the Bible tells us, unto us a child is born, but also unto us a son is given. Jesus always, the, the deity of Jesus always was, okay? He was there in the garden. He was there. In fact, he said in Luke chapter 10, I beheld Satan fall from heaven, which was way before Adam was created, okay? So it says, here's what Jesus said. This very, it's looking into heaven here. It says, wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he said, this is what Jesus said, Sacrifice and offerings thou, that's God, would not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. So it's first person. It says, And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Talking about God the Father. Then said I, Jesus, first person, Lo, I come in the volumes of the books written of me, which is what? The Old Testament. To do thy will, O God, Above when he said, Sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings and offerings for sin, thou would not, neither had pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will. Second time he said it. That he may establish, that he may take away the first covenant and establish the second. 
by the which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus once and for all. Amen. We're going to read on a little bit after, but, but we get a glimpse here. that I, I, There's a couple of things going on here. One thing I want you to see is that God had no pleasure in the Old Testament. <laughs> I mean, it was a necessity. He gave them the pattern of things, but it says he had no pleasure in the offering of sacrifices. It was necessary, and the law was necessary to point to Christ. The law was necessary to reveal what sin was and to reveal what, what sin and the condition of man was in. So it brought a knowledge of sin, but it also brought a knowledge of what was needed to correct the sin. But here we see a glimpse into heaven where Jesus said, Lo, I come to do your will. Prepare a body for me. So we learn here, because this is important to the message, that it was God's will, God's plan, God's purpose that Jesus come into the world. And you're going to learn a lot about Jesus today. We're going to learn a lot about his attitude and what he did. Because true salvation, again, if we go back to the last weeks, it's not a head knowledge, it's an understanding of what he did. You can sing Kumbaya and say, I love Jesus all I want, all you want. There has to be an awakening in your heart to bring you to a new place so that you change. And we studied that last week. It doesn't matter that you know that Jesus lived. It doesn't matter that you call him Lord. It doesn't matter. What matters is, is that there's a movement within you to believe him to a point where not only you confess him as Lord and Savior, because it says that if you do that, but you also have to believe he is Lord of your life, and you also have to believe that he died and was buried and resurre resurrected for you, and why? You need to understand why in the gospel. Because if you don't understand why, then you don't realize why you needed salvation. If you don't understand why you needed salvation, how can you believe in him and what he did? So we have to understand something beyond the superficial of what Jesus did for us. Amen? Amen. And so today I, I want to I push into, you know, not only what he did and what the Father did, but the attitude of Jesus to walk into this. I want you to see him because, again, we, 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 we talked about it in, in previous weeks. You know, one of the most profound revelations I had last year was when, when Jesus is talking to, to Peter. He said, Peter, do you love me? You know, feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Three times, right? This is after the resurrection. Okay, well, we fast forward. He's coddling him. We fast forward 60 years to the book of Revelations, Ephesians. You know, we see the, at the church at Ephesus in chapter 2. In, in Ephesus, they said, you know, hey, listen, you're doing great. You have patience. You're laboring for me. You're teaching. You're feeding the poor. You hate evil. You can discern between good teaching and bad teaching. But guess what? You don't love me the way you love me at the first. And if you don't love me the way you love me at the first, I'm going to fire you. I'm going to take your candlestick away. I'm going to take your church away. You, and, and, and we see a much different tone in the voice of Jesus. Amen? In other words, it's time to mature. Time to grow up. It's time to understand what the big picture is. So here, here we see Jesus talking about this body, talking about the Father having no pleasure in the Old Testament. I mean, it didn't bring him pleasure because it never, it never completed what he needed to have a relationship with us. Why did he save us? He saved us because he loves us and he wants a relationship. Why would he say, you don't love me the way you love me? I want you to love me like you did at the first. I want you to love me like a new couple. When a new couple gets married, right? They're, they're sitting next to each other. They're holding hands, right? You know, magically, 15 years later, the armrest is down. There's two coffees, and, <laughs> and who are you, right? Well, God doesn't want that. He wants something fresh in the relationship, amen? And, and it's up to us to keep that freshness. And frankly, it's listening to messages like this, to, you know, on, on a regular basis, that'll bring an understanding continually of what this man, what this, this, this God of ours did for us. Amen? So, so when you look at this, you know, Jesus uh, paid the price for us. And, and, and go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We looked at the scripture last week. 
<clears throat> and we're just going to look at one verse and then we're going to look at what, how it occurred. Just one verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. Just one verse, it says, For he hath made him, that's Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Amen? So what he's saying here is God is the he. He, God, made him, Jesus, to be sin for us. He made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin. He never sinned. Jesus was born outside of sin and never sinned for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Amen? And there's a, there's a critical piece. Now understand something. The plan of salvation in the gospel is God's plan. It's not your plan. It's not my plan. We can't rewrite that plan. We can't edit that plan. We have to look at what the plan is, accept it for what it is, and bring it into our life. Amen? I don't care if you don't like it. I don't care if it, if, if it rubs you wrong, but it's God's plan. Amen? And so we have to learn his plan and not change it or alter it. His plan is that he would take your sins, even the sins of the last week, and the sins that you haven't committed yet, and those sins were put on him for you. Very critical you understand that, because that makes it personal to you. He took your sins, when you said, I believe in you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. When you, I believe that you, were, that you died. But not only did you die, it wasn't just the death. God put our sins, our iniquities, our transgressions, our sickness, our grief, our poverty, and everything that occurred to us with the fall, put it all on him. And if you go back to the first week, we died our three parts. In last week, right? All three parts. Not only did our physical bodies die, right? Adam died and every human since then has died, except one. You know, that's extra credit. Okay, and, and, and our, his soul died. Adam's soul died, right? First thing, he was fearful. He was ashamed. He hid himself. He was depressed. He, he separated. He wanted to hide from God. So we see fear. And, and the same emotions that we fight now and, and, the, and the, the issues that we have emotionally all came flooding in because our soulish realm died because our spiritual bodies died because they were now separated from God. So you have the spirit die, the soul died, and then the physical body died. So Jesus had to pay for all three parts. And, and, and he made him to be our sin so that what? We could have redemption in the eyes of God. Now, if God's the judge, remember last week we learned that all men are condemned and the wrath of God is on them? Then God has to be satisfied with the sacrifice that Jesus did, right? And then he has to be satisfied with the faith that we have to move into this relationship. So that's what we're going to study th these next two weeks. Go to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. And again, as I, as I told you before, as we go through this series here, you know, we, we, may, we probably have another week or two. <clears throat> the big issue or the big thing that I, that I want to emphasize over and over again is have more than a superficial knowledge. Okay, have more than, you know, than a superficial knowledge and understand why, how, when, what, where, so that you can really have it in you as to why, because people are looking for answers. You know, it's as we talked about the first week with Judas. Judas went to church. Judas attended church. Judas worked in the church. Judas was there with him for three years. Judas knew Jesus could do miracles. But there was a difference between Judas, who was betraying Jesus, and Peter, who was denying Jesus. And it wasn't what they did. It was who they were inside. Amen? And we'll get to that next week. Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, let's just read the whole chapter. Start in verse 1. It says, Who hath believed our report, and 
to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed. For he shall grow up before him, he is Jesus, shall grow up before him, that's God, as a tender plant, when I say God, I mean God the Father, as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground, he hath no form nor comeliness, and we, when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. In other words, he's going to grow up, and he's, you know, you look at ten carpenters physically, and he looks like one of the guys. Okay, there's nothing, you know, he's not glowing, and, and you know, like there's a light on, or perfect hair, perfect teeth, whatever. He is a regular man. That's what that's saying. Don't write me about his teeth. I don't know what you know. Somebody will call. Trust me. So so, but but he he wasn't like a standout you know you know person. He was a regular guy. Okay, he had calluses on his hands. More than likely, he probably was physically fit because he was a carpenter, and they didn't have electricity back then. So they had to plane things with their hand and drill things with their hands and their arms. And so he made tables and chairs and doorways and doors and, you know, and, 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 and frames. So, you know, he worked with his hands. Verse, verse 3, it says, He is the spy, he, Jesus, is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Verse 4, surely he hath bore our grief. Now, when we say he, it's Jesus. When we say our, socket, you, could, you could put in your own name there. Make that individual or personal to you. In other words, he hath bore Sebastian's grief. He carried Sebastian's sorrow. Yet we did esteem him stricken, and smitten of who? Of God. And afflicted. But he, Jesus, was wounded for my, Sebastian, Mary, Steve, Mike, transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, the whipping, the scars in his back, we are healed. Amen? So we, we see here this, this substitutional work of Jesus because he goes through a list of what belonged to us, what we deserved as sinners, what we deserved as guilty before God, and he took what we deserved on him. So God put on him, you're going to see later in the chapter, God took your sins, your iniquities, your transgressions, your grief, your sorrows, your pain, your poverty, and your sickness, and put them all on him so that he paid for us. Amen? Amen? Amen. 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 I'm the only one on fire here. <laughs> Verse 5. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we are healed. And all we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned everyone to his own way. And listen, the Lord God laid on him the iniquity of us all. Okay, hold your finger here. Go over to Psalm 22. Remember Jesus is on the cross. He said seven things. Verse 1, it says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring, O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, and thou hearest not, and in the night season am not silent, but thou art holy, O thou that inhabits the praises of Israel. Okay, so when Jesus is on the cross, he was on the cross for six hours. While he's on the cross, it became dark after he was on the cross for three hours and he roared out, he yelled out, he screamed out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why are those so far from me? I yell in the daytime, I yell in the night. And this is where God turned away from him. This is where our sins, our iniquities, our transgressions, 
everything, all the filth of your life and my life and everyone else in humanity that would choose Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, this man, this, this being that had never experienced sin and had never experienced separation from God, now experienced it. It was all put on him. And for three hours, and it's the only time we really see him ask for help from men. He said, what did he say? I thirst. The only time. I mean, every other, t every other time he asked the Father, if there's any way for this cup to pass. But he asked, I thirst. I mean, and, and we'll see. We're going to go back and read Psalm 22. But I want you to see that, that because what happens, what is spiritual death? Separation from God. Right? God turned away from him. He answered the question, but you are holy. You're separate. You're holy. You can't, you can't come into this arena. So God put our sins on him and turned away. And Jesus, for the first time in eternity, had been separated from God because of your sin and my sin. You know, when you confessed this week or last week, whenever you went before the Father, that sin was paid for by this event. This event. Okay, back to uh, Isaiah chapter 53. Verse 6 again, let's read it one more time. And we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. The Lord, God the Father, hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, and so he opened not his mouth. In other words, he did not complain. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Who shall declare to his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgressions of my people, and he was stricken. So now we see, we see spiritual death, right? The separation from God. And now we see physical death in verse 8. He was separated from the land of the living. For what? For the transgressions of the people. Amen? Verse 9, And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord, it ple and I'm going to go through this and add father or son, and it pleased the father to bruise Jesus. He, the Father, put him to grief when he shall make his soul, here's the third part now, he'll make his soul, his mind, his will, his intellect, his, his, his reasoning, his soul, an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. God the Father, verse 11, shall see the travail of his soul, the third part of us, and shall what? Be satisfied. God will be satisfied. By his knowledge, my, many, my righteous servants will justify many, for he shall bear, he shall carry their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors. He bare the sins of many and made intercessions for the transgressors. Amen? Amen. <laughs> so we see here that we see the three parts of man. We see him paying for the three parts of men. And I don't care what Mel Gibson did in The Passion. I mean, he did a very close job, but nobody, I think, could, could imagine how marred and scarred he was by, by the Romans. In fact, if you look at chapter 52, and chapter of Isaiah, we're, we're in 53, just 52. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and very high. As many were astonished at his visage, that means as many were astonished at the image of him. He was so marred more than any man in his form more than the sons of men. In other words, it's saying, in, in the commentaries on this say, he was so marred more than any man that had ever been beaten within an inch of his life. He was that bruised, that beaten, that broken. And, and stripped alive and hung on the cross to die for six hours. Naked. I mean, and 
He's dying for the people that are hanging him on the cross. Because some of the centurions got saved. If you read the Gospels. I mean, when they, when they seen, you know, they only seen, he prayed, first of all. When they put the nails in his hand, he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do, right? He, they never seen that before. Roman guards never seen that before. Usually they're cursing their mother, their, the guard's mother, the guard's father. I mean, the, you know, yelling out, screaming, I'm innocent, save me. No, I, you, know, you know, this man kept his mouth shut and said, For, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. I mean, that, that's huge. The other thing, go back to, go over now to, uh, to Psalm 22. Now, you and me live through traumatic events in our life, right? But never did we read and write about them before they happened. Okay, he did. He read Psalm 22. He wrote Psalm 22. Yeah. He said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He mean, he's seen the event. He knew what he was walking into. And I just want to read this for you because I want you to see, again, this is first person. You, you see him say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? David wrote this, but it's by the Holy Spirit and it's prophetic to Jesus. Oh my God, I pray to thee in, in the daytime and thou hearest not in the night season and I'm not silent, but thou art holy, thou that inhabits the praises of Israel. Our father trusted in thee, and they trusted, and thou did deliver them. They cried unto thee, and were delivered. They trusted in thee, and were not confounded. But I am a worm. In other words, you delivered them, but I'm a worm, and no man a reproach of men and despised of the people. Do you see what he's saying there? You delivered Israel, you're not going to deliver me here. He feels forsaken. He feels like, like God abandoned him, but he knows better. You'll see. It says, all they that see me laugh at me with scorn. And they shoot out their lips and shake their heads saying, he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him seeing he delighteth in him. Have you ever said somebody say, oh, all that prayer you have? You know, is God ever going to answer your prayer? Yeah, well, you know, the, sometimes we have to wait quite a while, but God answers our prayer. Amen? Amen? It says, And he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighteth in him. But thou art he that took me, that's God the Father, out of the womb, and thou made me hope when I was, when I was upon my mother's breasts. I was cast upon thee from the womb, Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls have encompassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset around me. They, they, they gaped upon me with their mouths, and a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All of my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax in the melted in the midst of my bowels, my strength is dried up like a pot shed. My tongue cleaves to my jaw. Thou hast brought me to the dust of death. Okay, so remember, he didn't have a broken bone, but he, his, he says his bones were out of joint, right? Very painful. He says, you brought me to the brink of death. Verse 10, for dogs have encompassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones, look and stare upon me. They parted my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Be not far from me, O Lord. O my strength has thee to help me. Amen. And so, so we see here, and you know, this is Jesus on the cross, but he read it before. I can't emphasize it enough. You know, it's, it's one thing for me to experience a bad day tomorrow, but to know <clears throat> what you're walking into and to know what the, what was required of you and to read it and write it before makes it a whole different experience. It's I mean there's an element of fear that can come with that. I mean and we see we see his body sweating great drops of blood, right? And we see the Bible says he was in agony that was in his soul. 
So his soul is saying, is there any way for this cup to pass for me? His body's saying, no, 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 right? But his spirit said, not my will, but your will be done, God. Amen. You see, that's a mini version of what we need to do every day, is, is to put our body under and to put our soul under and let our spirit guide our decisions and our actions and our words and our reactions in life. Amen? Now, here's the thing. Go over to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, verse 51. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand, drew his sword, struck a servant of the high priest, and smote off his ear. Then said Jesus unto him, Put again thy sword into its place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou, now look at, listen to this, please. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently or immediately give me more than twelve legions of angels. But how then shall the scripture be fulfilled that thus it must be? Okay? So we learned something very important here. He could have tapped out any time. <laughs> he could have said, this isn't worth it. These people, just destroy them. I mean, that now that's a whole different element, right? Because now he's telling us he can pray for deliverance and get it. Which means God gave him the call, the purpose, and the plan, but he of his own accord had to walk all the way through it. Doesn't that change it just a little bit? Think about that, please. He willingly, knowingly walked in to the, this traumatic event where he was so marred, they couldn't tell if he was male or female, more marred than any man. And at any point in the process, he could have prayed and God would have delivered him. Huh. And he did that for you and me. Not as a group, individually. He did it for you and me individually. You know, that's why when you look in the scripture, you know, we can, let's just go through the scriptures. Look in John chapter 15. John 15. Verse 12. It says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I, as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life, willingly lay down his life for his friend. You are my friends. In other words, I'm going to lay my life down for you. If you do whatsoever I command. You see that? Willingly lay down a life. Go over to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians 1, 3 and 4. It says, Grace be unto you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father. Amen? Who gave his life for us. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. It says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Walk in love as Christ hath also loved us and hath given himself for us, an offering, a sacrifice to God, for sweet, selling, uh, uh, sweet smelling savor. Amen? Verse 30 of chapter 4 of Ephesians. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted one another, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has what? Forgiven you. Forgiven you, right? Go over to Titus chapter 2. Verse 13, it says, Looking for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous for good works. 
These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Amen. Go over to 1 John chapter 3. We read over these words sometimes. We don't digest them. 1 John chapter 3, verse 14, it says, For we know, or literally John, we should know, that we have passed from death unto life, because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abides, what? In death. And we're going to take this up in the next few weeks. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. You know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby we perceive we are the... We, 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 Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whosoever hath this world's goods and sees his brother having need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Amen? And hereby, this is how we know that we are of the truth or of the word of God and shall assure our hearts before him in love. Amen? One more. Go over to Philippians chapter 2. Do you see the pattern here? Philippians chapter 2. It said, let this mind be, chapter verse 5, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but who? He, Jesus, made himself of no reputation. Jesus made himself of no reputation. Took upon him the form of a servant. <clears throat> he was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he, Jesus, humbled himself. He, Jesus, became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. You know, I, I read you these five or six tranches of Scripture because I want you to see something. I, I want you to see that he willingly did this for, for I'm going to use me. He willingly did this for me. He died for me. If I was the only one, he would have died for me. But he died for the world that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So this sacrifice, I mean, just think about this for a second. Just let's, let's, let's cut away all the fat from this, okay? If there was any other way, would God have done it? He would have. This had to be the only way to save humanity. There's no other way. You can't be good enough. If you think you could be good enough, then why would he have to do this? Do you understand? Because people still equate, you know, pluses and minuses. Mm -hmm. Good deeds, bad deeds. No, that's all garbage because we're all bad. Right? We're born with this defect. So if there's any other way, he would have done it. This was necessary to satisfy the courts of heaven so that Satan and all of the fallen angels and any created being could go to God and, and not have an evil complaint against him. Yes. He had to satisfy his own laws to bring the salvation the way no one could question his authority in making the decision that you and I, who are weak at best, who wake up every day and try to live the life and, 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 and are given to the word of God and, and fight through this life, putting down the flesh and putting down the soul and being ridiculed by others and judged by others, how we believe in this God that gave us his son. Amen? Amen. Amen. Do you understand? So there is no other way. And this was what was necessary. So, so when I look at salvation... Because a lot of people remember how I think. I think if it's a coin toss between how you make doctrine, I always go 
to the harsher side of the equation because you don't want to get this wrong. Okay? You, there's no coming back. Remember last week? Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not? Right? It was too late for them. Right? So it's not just believing in Jesus Christ. You know, it starts there, but it's believing in what he did for you. Because once you know that, now you know why. why. He expects you to forgive the way he forgave. He expects you to walk in love the way he walked in love. You know, my, my, my father had a great saying, but I, you know, I mean, it, it just doesn't work biblically. Don't do as I do, do as I say. Heard that a couple times. That's not God. What God just says is, follow me. I'm going to show you the way. I'm going to live the life as an example. And then you follow what I did so that you, can, you, so that you, have, you have no excuse. Because I did it. I forgave those that despitefully used me, used me and persecuted me. I prayed for them that hated me. I fed them that, that hated me. I helped them that hated me. And so we're called to do that. Amen? Amen? Now, through the eyes of God, you're the Father in heaven, right? You just made your son go through all of this, right? Do, do you think he wants some superficial relationship from some mud man who has no commitment to Jesus Christ? I'm getting hard here. He doesn't want a Sunday Christian. You're either all in or you're all out. Do you understand? That's why. I mean, the Father looks at the lukewarm Christianity and says, I don't want you. I reject you. You know, so you start looking at the scriptures... And, and, and there's a lot of babies in Christ. Please don't get all, all twisted on me. But, but understand something. When I look at Christianity, I'm a teacher. When I look at Christianity, I have to tell you, God wants all of you. That's right. All of you. He wants all your heart. He wants you all in. He wants you living for him, walking with him, him participating in your life. He wants you making decisions based on us and not me. Do you see? That's why he calls it spiritual adultery when you pray for things in the world, right? Giving into the hands of Satan. So, you know, I, I don't want to get into it this week, but that was the difference between Peter and Judas. Here's, here's the difference. Go over to John chapter 6, and we'll, we'll close here. John 6. Okay, let me let me just set it up. Jesus just gets done. To, let's let's read it. Let's just read it. <laughs> we we might not have to come next week. <laughs> I'm kidding. <clears throat> Verse fifty three. It says, Jesus said unto them, Verily I verily say unto you, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things, these things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Right? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Does this offend you? What if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up 
where he was before. In other words, he, he came down. It says, it is the spirit that quickeneth, and the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. So he's telling them, it's not flesh. I'm talking to you spiritually. I'm telling you a spiritual thing. You're not, you're not cannibalism. Eating, drinking blood was illegal in the law. So it's, it's, it, 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 it's, it's spirit, he's saying. It's not physical. He said, but there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should what? Betray him. So what did Judas do? He believed not and he betrayed him. And he said, therefore said I unto you that no man can come to me except it were given unto him of my father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also go away? Now let's look at the confidence here. How many pastors would do this? You know, hey, do you all want to leave? Go ahead, get out. Uh, you, you don't see that often, right? <laughs> That's what he said. Isn't that what he said? You want to leave? Go. Then said Simon Peter and answered him, said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Where are we going to go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. We believe that thou art sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, but one of you is a devil? And he spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. I mean, think about that, right? Think, think, I mean, the, think about this. this guy went to church every week, every day. There were the twelve, right, which were with Jesus 24-7, right? Then there were disciplined believers, disciples. They're, they were disciplined in their walk. Then there were believers. They believed. And then there were just followers. So when you look at Jesus, the closest to the nucleus to him were these 12 that were with him every day, right? And, and the difference between the 11, because at the Last Supper, last week we looked at it, right? Or a week before we looked at it, they couldn't pick Judas out of a crowd. He looked like he fit in. It wasn't obvious. They said, is it I? Is it I? And, and, and it wasn't obvious to them. He looked like a believer. He fit in. He went through the motions. But there wasn't this change in him. And we get, begin to see it here. We'll study it more as we go. But we, see, we begin to see here that Jesus said from the beginning he didn't believe. He's going through the motions and, and remember, when he arrest, when they arrested him, he said, lead him away safely, Mark chapter 14. Don't harm him. Keep him under guard. So there was this difference is internal, amen? It's not external. Well, with that, we're going to close in prayer. <laughs> Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for your word today, Lord God. We thank you for the message, the gospel, Father, the gospel, the word of God, this, the salvation that you've given us. Jesus, we love you so much. We're so thankful for what you did for us. We, we owe you our lives. It's a reasonable service to give you our lives. Father, we bring up some prayer requests. We pray for John, who is in the ICU. He needs healing from, uh, from the living God. Father, we just extend our faith toward John and pray in the name of Jesus, Lord God. Whatever ailment, whatever abnormality, whatever issues are in his physical body, Lord God, we pray for mercy. We pray that the stripes of Jesus would touch his physical body. Be healed, John, in Jesus' name. We pray for salvation for my son, Michael. Lord God, we pray, Father, you can't make a decision but, Lord God, our prayers that you make a circumstance, that you bring an encounter, that you bring a revelation, that you bring an eye-opening event, Lord God, that would shake Michael at his root, that would give him an undeniable experience that he would reach out with his faith, and Satan would not have him, Father, but he'd become part of our family. In Jesus' name, amen. We pray for baby Zoe, which weighs three pounds. Lord God, we pray for this precious life. Lord God, we pray in Jesus' name, Father, that there be no complications, no side effects. And we pray that this child would supernaturally grow and, Father, be a testimony to those around her family, Lord. We pray that you bless her, Father, with long life. 
Father, don't allow Satan to take this young one, Lord God. She's born of water. She's born of the flesh. Bring her to maturity and allow her to live out a life serving you, Lord God. Lord, we give you honor. We give you glory. We give you praise. Lord, we love you so much. We're so thankful to you, Jesus. We thank you for your word tonight. We pray that it would not soon leave our hearts and minds, but be branded to us, Lord God. And I pray that your spirit would continue to develop and expand this word in our hearts and minds through this whole week. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. See you next week. Oh, the tax statements are in the back table. They're in alphabetical order. Try to keep them in alphabetical order if you can. <laughs> Huh? Well, yeah. Yeah. By the way, guys, those of you that called in or emailed regarding the audio on the messages and the half message that's been fixed, um, one of them you have to turn the volume way up. Um, so. Yeah.